Shall we get started? Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. Let's see what it looks like. the most recognizable profile in Hollywood is Alfred Hitchcock. We're going to be talking for the next several weeks about him and his life's work. He's, uh, he's one of my favorite movie makers. He's made some great movies. We want to get started this morning, though. I want to know what you know about Alfred Hitchcock. Wait, let me, let me get him up here so he can see what's going on. No, it's all right. How? Yeah, the theme song is actually like you know, it is, uh, Funeral March of the Marionettes. That's right. His theme song is called Funeral March of the Marionettes. And when you know it's about a marionette, it sounds like it. All right. How many, uh, let's see how many Hitchcock movies we can name. Birds. The Birds. North by Northwest. Psycho. Psycho. Rope. Rope. That's a good one. Rear Window. Vertigo, suspicion. Oh, we got rear window. What? The man who knew too much. Yes. Oh, what about Harry? We got that one. Uh, it's thirty-nine steps. It's a bunch of steps. Wow, y'all are doing better than the Lanks class did. They only came up with seven. I got strangers on a train. Very good. That's good. Eleven. Anybody else got one? Notorious. Thank you. That's twelve. Good. Okay, twelve movies. Alfred Hitchcock made fifty-nine feature films in a career that spanned more than fifty-five years. He worked for a long time because he loved movies. And uh, he loved to make them. He would have done it for nothing if he had had to. Now, this is the way we always picture Alfred Hitchcock. Look, I got co-director credit there. <laughs> we always picture him like this, but uh, that's how we saw him mostly, say, around the 60s. Earlier on, he looked a little bit different. A, a little plumper, a little more hair. And if we go back a few years before that, though, you wouldn't even recognize him. Yeah, look at that little mustache. Alfred Joseph Hitchcock was born in London in the year 1899. 1899. So he was brand new with the, the 20th century. And a lot of the innovations that came in the 20th century were extremely important to him. He was right there for all of those. He had one experience when he was a young boy uh, growing up in London, and his parents were, it was not a poor family. His father was a merchant. They, they had uh, material things. He, he was not a poor child. But he had one formative experience when he was young. Now, this is not him, but it's, it's the right time, the right outfit. It could have been him. He was very much like this. One day his father sent young Alfred I uh, gave him a note and said, take this note down to the police station. So he goes to the police station and he gives the note to the sergeant on duty there. The sergeant opens the note and reads it, says, all right, come with me. And he leads this little boy back into the jail and into a cell and then... He closes the door and locks it and walks away. And he stays gone for 10 or 15 minutes. And this little boy is terrified. And finally, the policeman comes back and unlocks the door and he says, that's what we do to naughty little boys. <laughs> His father, Alfred Hitchcock's father, had written a note to the policeman saying, I want you to show my son what happens to bad boys. And so he locked him up for a few minutes. 
It terrified this young man, though, and he maintained this fear for the rest of his life. I found an interview from, remember the Tomorrow Show with Tom Snyder? Uh, Tom Snyder asked him this question. This question. Come on, Tom. All right. All the pictures that you do scare people. Mm -hmm. What frightens you? What are you afraid of? Most things. I'm scared of policemen. I never drive a car on the theory that if you don't drive a car, you can't get a ticket. So therefore, that's absolutely true. I'm scared stiff of anything that is to do with the law. Although I'm fascinated by it, but I would hate to be involved myself. So for the rest of his life, he had a, a great fear of the police. And this shows up in a lot of movies. Any of the movies that you named a minute ago, chances are real good that somewhere in that movie there's a law enforcement officer and it's going to scare the, the hero or the heroine to death, uh, even if they're innocent, or maybe especially if they're innocent. Because that's another great theme of Hitchcock movies is the wrongfully accused person. The innocent person who is accused of something and either has to go on the run to prove their innocence or find the real culprit. That pops up over and over again. That's a theme we'll look more at in, uh, in the next couple of weeks. But so he grows up with this enormous fear of the law. And therefore, Alfred Hitchcock was always a model citizen. He didn't, uh, didn't do any of the juvenile delinquent type things that a lot of people might have gotten involved in. He, he walked a pretty straight line. He grew up in the Catholic Church. His education from the age of 11 on was, was at a Jesuit school called St. Ignatius in London. And although later years people would say, do you think your religion uh, is reflected in your films? He would say no, but he was wrong. The things he learned as a Catholic and, and going to a Catholic school pop up over and over again. There's one trait that is instilled into you if you're born Catholic or if you're born Jewish or sometimes if you're born Baptist, there's one trait that gets instilled in you. What is it? Guilt. guilt. <laughs> he had that trait his whole life. He felt guilty even when he hadn't done anything. And a lot of us can identify with that. What do you do when you look in the rearview mirror and there's a police car behind you? You wonder what they're going to arrest you for and you haven't even done anything. So guilt would pop up over and over again. He would also have a lot of fun portraying uh, priests and other clergymen, nuns in his movies. They, they would often be figures of some comedy. So he poked fun at the Catholic Church sometimes, but he remained an avid churchgoer his whole life. Even when he was in his 70s living in Hollywood, he went to, to Mass every Sunday, he and his wife. Well, he grew up in London, and, and he was not a great student, but he obviously had a creative mind. He started working for a company that manufactured things and did electroplating. And they got involved in making cables, including cables that were used in what was then a brand new industry, movie production. Now, young Alfred Hitchcock loved movies. From the first one he saw, he realized, wow, these, these, this is amazing. It's a great way to communicate. And he wanted to know all he could about it. He went to the movies every week, sometimes many times during the week. More than anybody in his family cared about the movies. And so he wanted to be involved in that so badly, but he didn't know how to, to get into it. Well, the company he worked for, this electroplating company that was making the cables, they had him working with sales and orders and things like that, and he was terrible at it. He said his tendency was to let orders pile up and pile up and pile up, and then one day he would just plow through the whole bunch of them. And they would say, wow, you did all of that in one day? And he would say, yes. But of course, the three weeks before that, he hadn't really done anything. And so he kind of worked in spurts like that. And so they said, well, this might not be the right department. They moved him to the advertising department of this company, where he got to design ads and brochures and things like that. And this turned out to be something he was really talented at. His mind had a unique sense of humor, and he would make promotional pieces that got a lot of attention and increased sales. 
So he thought, how can I get into the movie business? He heard that or read that a studio in London was going to be making a film of a novel that had come out recently. So he bought a copy of the book and he sat down and he wrote a script, wrote a script for the whole book and sent it to the movie studio. They ended up not making that, that movie at all, but they were impressed that somebody would go to that much effort. And so he eventually got a, a job writing what are called title cards. Now, we don't have title cards anymore. But in the silent era, and by the way, of those 59 films that Hitchcock made, 10 of them were silent. His career spans from the silent movie era up to the mid-70s uh, when everything was color and cinemascope and stereo sound. He, he pretty well covered the history of, of motion pictures. But his first job in movies was writing title cards. Now, when you make a silent movie, you can't convey everything just with pictures. Every once in a while, you have to say, here's what these people are saying or thinking or here's where they are. And so title cards would come up on the, the screen occasionally. They would say things like, Betty, I have something very serious to say to you alone. Or, because into our empty lives has swept a force that is overwhelming us both. <laughs> and sometimes the cards had artwork and were a little more involved, like this one from the D.W. Griffith Company. Do men look for the true heart in women, or are most of them caught by the net of paint, powder, and suggestive clothes? <laughs> paint and powder. It works, right? Yeah. Uh, and so he began to write the title cards for silent movies. And he, he would work in collaboration with the director because if you've ever seen a silent movie, they don't put every line of dialogue on the screen. That would be maddening if you had to read every line. They only drop it in every once in a while when you need to know specifically. So they'll show a couple talking. And then every once in a while, there'll be a title card saying what one of them is saying, just in order to move the plot along. So this is his door into the motion picture business. And, and he's very happy doing it because he loves the movie so much. And he figures, this is what I'm going to be doing the rest of my life. I'm going to be writing and illustrating title cards for movies. And he would have stayed doing that if something hadn't happened that he did not foresee. And here it is. As a writer and designer of titles for silent films, which was your first job in the film world, did you hope to become a director one day, or did that happen by chance? Happened by chance. Um, my earliest job, after being uh, in the editorial department designing the titles, uh, was a, being assistant director, and then I practiced my hand at writing a script. I did it on my own. I took a story, a novel, and eventually a job came up where uh, I was going to be the assistant director. And um, they said, well, we've got to find somebody to write a script. Who's going to do the script? So I said, I'll do it. They read it and were impressed, and then I got the job. I was 23 then. And then, then my friend, who was going to be the art director on the same picture, uh, found he couldn't come on this particular picture. It was a big, important picture. It wasn't a, a small picture. I said, I'll do the art direction, design the sets and so forth, which I did. And therefore, for about two or three years after that, I carried out the same routine. And then finally, uh, I believe, I'm not sure, but I was told that the director of all these pictures was uh, very jealous because... Um, I was getting credit for, for, the, for all this amount of work, and then he said he didn't want me anymore. So the producer said, would I like to direct? And I said, it would never occurred to me. I was very happy doing what I was doing. Now, here's, here's the first amazing thing about the story of Alfred Hitchcock. Here he is directing an early uh, film. He nearly missed this career. He said it happened purely by accident. Now, how many of you have never seen a Hitchcock movie, to your knowledge? Wow. Well, that's impressive. <laughs> How many of you have, have seen more than one? 
Boy, a lot of you. I'm so proud of y'all. Let me get my grade book. Uh, purely by accident, he got the chance to direct a movie. Now, periodically, as we go through this study in the next several weeks, we're going to find things about Alfred Hitchcock. We're going to find lessons to be learned from his life. We're going to find experiences or things that we can uh, take to heart. In fact, I've called them things we can hitch onto. <laughs> I spent a long time on that. <laughs> hitch onto this, number one, is this. Dents can be directions. Now, what does that mean? Well, you get a dent in your car and you think, oh my gosh, there goes my whole week. I'm going to have to be tied up with this. But you know, sometimes little bumps in life can point us in a direction where we're really supposed to be going. So when I talk about dents can be directions, I'm referring to accidents or coincidence or even providence. Sometimes things happen and they seem trivial at the time. They seem in, insignificant. And only in hindsight, sometimes we look back and say, you know, right there, right there is the moment when my life changed. Right there is when I went the direction I had been searching for my whole life. So that's what I mean when I say dents can be directions. In this case, uh, an accident a coincidence of being in the right place at the right time when they needed somebody to direct a very low budget movie, he was ready. Or I don't know if he thought he was ready or not, but anyway, he said, yes, I will. And sometimes that's more than half the battle is just being able to say, yes, I will. He learned as he was doing it. He had been observing all the time he'd been working on these title cards. He'd been watching directors. What do they do? How do they know how to, to photograph a scene? What did they tell the actors? How did they interpret the script? And he had soaked all this up like a sponge. And so when his chance came, he was ready. And he jumped in and he began to direct. Well, I don't know how much you know about Hitchcock. He is generally regarded as the greatest motion picture director uh, of the 20th century. He is certainly regarded as the greatest British director of all time. He was the first he directed the first feature film in, in Britain with sound. He did the very first one. So we had the jazz singer over here. They had an Alfred Hitchcock movie over there. That's how prominent he was just in England. When he finally moved to uh, the United States and began to work in Hollywood, he was a, a name already at a time when nobody knew who directed movies. We just knew that they show up every week at the theater. Well, Alfred Hitchcock was a name, probably the first superstar director. What kind of movies did he make? Scary. Now, see, it's interesting to hear what you have to say. Because some people say, oh, he made horror movies. He didn't make horror movies. You might be able to call Psycho a horror movie. But other than that, he didn't make horror movies. He says he didn't make mysteries. He said, I don't make whodunit stories where you have to wait till the end to discover who, who did it. He made suspense movies, and he's often referred to as the master of suspense. And so uh, that's to me, is the best way to, to look at his work. He said in one interview, uh, there was a press conference, and a lady in the crowd said, Mr. Hitchcock, how come you've never made a comedy? He said, all of my pictures are comedies. <laughs> he said all of his films were funny. They were all made with a sense of humor. See, Alfred Hitchcock, if you get right down to it, was a roller coaster designer. He wanted to make you feel the same things that happen on a roller coaster. Because what happens? Well, you get the anticipation of going up that first big hill thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And then you get to the top and you see down and you go, oh no, oh no, oh no. And then you start down that hill and what do you do? You scream your head off. And then you get to the bottom of the hill and what do you do? You laugh. Woo, that was fun. Let's do it again. That's exactly how he played his movies. Uh, he wanted you to feel the anticipation. He wanted you to scream your head off, and then he wanted you to laugh and say, oh, that was cool, let's do it again. 
He was a roller coaster designer. And that's a good thing to keep in mind if you go back and watch some of his movies now. Some of you that have only seen one or two, man, you're missing a lot of good stuff. He made some awesome movies. And, and when you go back and look at them, you know, I have very little patience with people that say, uh, I don't like to watch those old black and white movies. Are you kidding? <laughs> that's like saying, uh, no, I don't like music before 1998. <laughs> what? You're missing the good stuff. Don't, don't turn down a movie because it's in black and white. Black and white is beautiful. And especially if it's a Hitchcock movie, you will have a good time. But you'll run into trouble if you start thinking too much about, well, that story doesn't really make a lot of sense. Or I don't think that person would have actually done Forget that. Enjoy the ride. It's all about the ride. Uh, you might not automatically think that a movie like Psycho could be considered a comedy. But listen to what he has to say about it. You must have a basic sense of humor about it because that's what you're doing. You're doing it deliberately to scare people. And after all, there's no difference between my making psycho to scare people with tongue in cheek, shall we say, than a mother who says boo to scare her three months old baby. What's the difference? <laughs> I love how tickled he gets talking about that because that's, that's really the way he looked at it. What's the difference between what we do with little babies when we go, boo, and the baby goes, and then the baby laughs. That's exactly what he did with us. We're just big babies, and he's just saying boo to us. Uh, it's not anything more serious than that. It's not anything more sinister than that. It's just fun. Now, there's a distinction he always made, he was always asked, a distinction between surprise and suspense. And he would always illustrate it with a story. And I'll tell it to you like he would tell it to you if he were standing here right now. So let's say we're sitting here on Sunday morning and we're having class and our teacher's standing up here talking about something. Little do any of us know there is a bomb under one of the chairs in this auditorium. And as I'm talking along and everybody is, well, most everybody is listening. <laughs> Some people are sleeping. All of a sudden, the bomb goes off. Now, the people watching the movie of this are going to be very surprised because that was totally unexpected. But there was no suspense at all. And Hitchcock would say, here's how you make it suspenseful. He said, before the class begins, we see a shadowy figure creep into the room. We see him attach a bomb underneath a chair. And on this bomb is a timer that says 1130. And he said, then we see the room fill up with people. And every once in a while, we cut to a shot under that chair. And then we see someone sit on that chair. And other people sit around it. And then we see the clock in the back of the room that says 1120. And then we cut back to the class and the teacher telling his story. And then we cut back to that bomb. And then we cut to the clock and it says 1125. And then we cut to the audience and everybody's just sitting there. And some people are asleep and some people are, are doing other things. And then we cut back to the clock and it's 1129. And then we see the second hand sweeping around towards the top. That is suspense. The same thing happens, but do you see the difference in the impact? And that's what he specialized in was building suspense. I'm going to give you an example of it here. Look how he builds the suspense in this scene from the birds. Now, earlier in the movie, you know, there's, there's been these unprovoked attacks. For some reason, nobody knows, birds have started attacking people. And so Tippi Hedren, a not very good actress, she's not, I'm sorry, she's very pretty, but she's, she's part of a, uh, a type that Hitchcock really like to use in his movies, the icy cold blonde. Now sometimes they could act like Grace Kelly, uh, Ingrid Bergman, Doris Day. Sometimes, eh, not so much. Uh, Tippi Hedren, he made a couple of movies with Tippi Hedren, and so she, she tries her best to convey some emotion in this scene, but the, what I want you to notice is how he builds the suspense. What happens in this scene? She's sitting at a playground, and some birds come in. That doesn't sound like much, but here's how he does it. Quality will 
So Hitchcock was one of the first directors to realize what cameras could do that you couldn't do on stage. In the early silent movie days, making a movie meant you set up a camera like this one is set up here and you filmed a play. But Hitchcock realized you could do so much more. That scene from the birds, you could never do that on stage. First, it'd be really hard to get birds to do that. But <laughs> second, when you watch something on stage, you can look anywhere. You can say, oh, there's birds over there. Look at the schoolhouse set over there. That's cool how they did that. Oh, look at Tippy Hedren's shoes. Aren't those cute? I wonder where she got those. Hmm, well, what else is going on here? Hitchcock realized that he could make the camera be your eyes, and he could show you exactly what he wanted you to see and nothing else. It's like he's sitting there holding your head in his hand saying, no, look here, now look here, now look here. And that's exactly how he uses the camera. And that, there's enormous power in that because when he makes the camera become your eyes, he can make you a part of the movie. You remember the scene in Psycho at the Bates Motel where Norman Bates is peeking through the hole in the wall at Janet Lee? He shows it from Anthony Perkins' point of view, and in doing so, he makes you the voyeur. He makes you the guilty party. Or he shows the policeman in Janet Lee's rearview mirror and he makes you feel that fear. Oh no, there's a policeman behind me. Does he know I'm guilty or something? He, he makes us part of the movie by the way he uses uh, his camera. And he was the first to really discover the power of that and to use it. And so the next thing that, that I believe in his life that we can hitch on to is this lesson. Suspense is not horror. Suspense is not terror. Suspense is just anticipation. I wonder sometimes if, if the reason so many people are, are so afraid of death is because they don't understand the difference between these two terms. And so they think, oh, I don't want to die. I'm scared to die. Why? It's going to happen. No matter what you think, it's going to happen. But death is not a horrible thing. You can die in a horrible way, that's true. But death itself is not, is not a terror, especially for people of faith. Now, it's suspenseful, yeah. We don't know when it's coming. So I always want to be ready. So I'm not afraid of death. I think sometimes I wonder when it's going to happen. What if it's closer than I think? That suspense is fine. But don't live your life in fear. Live your life in anticipation of what's going to happen. Because even when you think about death, that's going to be a trying time. But aren't you curious to know what's going to happen next? I can't wait to see what happens in the moment after I close my eyes for the last time. And I, I anticipate that. The suspense is, is palpable. And even if we pull back to a, a smaller level from life and death, you know, sometimes people say, Mike, do you, do you still get nervous when you talk in front of a group or when you sing uh, at church or something? And I say, every single time. I get nervous every Sunday morning before I stand up here. Why? It's not fear. No, it's anticipation. It's suspense. It's me wanting to know that I'm going to remember to say the things I wanted to say. It's me hoping that I make a connection with you. It's me hoping that everything technically goes right that's supposed to happen. I'm nervous, but it's a good kind of nervous. I'm anticipating. I want everything to be accomplished. Suspense is great. Horror, terror, fear is tragic. And they are not the same thing. And that's one lesson all of us need to know. Don't be terrified of the unknown. Be excited about the possibilities. Well, I, I talked about how Hitchcock used the, the camera as our eyes and realized the importance of, of using the camera that way. He was also a pioneer in the use of editing. And you know the shower scene in Psycho? I'm afraid I'm not, even I am not brave enough to show you that scene in Sunday school this morning. <laughs> I'd hate to lose my job for that. But hopefully everybody knows that scene. At least knows of it if you haven't ever seen it. It's a powerful, powerful scene. 
Did you know that scene lasts about 45 seconds? But it is made up of 78 pieces of film, 78 separate shots. It took them seven days to film that 45 second scene. Now, why do it that way? Well, because the impact it has. By doing it that way, we are bombarded with these horrible, scary images, one right after the other, boom, 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 until we feel like the victim. We feel like we're the one in the shower getting attacked at our most vulnerable time. And we identify so much with Janet Lee in that scene because he has put us in that place and said, it's not just something that happens. What if that was all done in one shot? She's in the shower and the shower curtain opens and there's the person with the knife and the camera's just sitting back in the corner feeling. That would have no impact at all. But the way he edited it and put it together, it is horrifying. It was, it was the scariest thing I saw. I saw that movie in a theater when I was about 13 and I did not know what was coming. I don't even know why I went to that movie because I didn't know anything about Alfred Hitchcock at that time. But it was showing at the Rialto Theater in Alice, and I was sitting there on a Saturday afternoon, and oh my gosh, it scared me to death. I was literally sitting there with my hands over my face. I remember that vividly, peeking out through them. And I was not the only one. The power of editing can completely change the impact and sometimes the meaning of a, a film. Uh, he often used an example when telling what editing could accomplish. And in this time, in this interview, he, uh, he uses himself to illustrate what editing can do. And how it can be changed to create a different idea. Now we have a close up. Let me show what he sees. Let's assume he saw a woman holding a baby in her arms. Now we cut back to his reaction to what he sees. And he smiles. Now what is he as a character? He's a kindly man. He's sympathetic. Now, let's take the middle piece of film away, the woman with the child, but leave his two pieces of film as they were. Now we'll put in uh, a piece of film of a girl in a bikini. He looks, girl in a bikini, he smiles. What is he now? The dirty old man. He's no longer the benign gentleman who loves babies. That's the difference. That's what film can do for you. Now, that's a very simple example, but it really makes a powerful point in that the way a film is edited can totally change the impact it has, and sometimes the type of film it is. Did you know Woody Allen's movie Annie Hall was originally a drama? It was originally going to be called Anhedonia. And they, they filmed it. There were hours of film, and they got it down, and they were going to make this serious movie. And they, they hated it when they had it put together. And so they went back into the editing room and took out a lot of the serious parts of the movie and put in more of the funny parts of the movie, and it ended up winning the Academy Award as Best Picture that year. One of the few comedies to ever win that award. An editor can change the whole tone of a film. He can take out all the parts that distract or detract from the characterization. Uh, he can cut out parts that don't advance the story. And the cool thing is, the thing that you can hitch on to is this. If you don't like your life, you have the power to edit. That thing that you've been carrying around that, that burdens you, that happened long, long, long ago, and you feel like you can't get rid of it, you can't. Snip it right out of your movie. You're writing a story every day, and you have the ability to go back and rip out some of the pages that distract you, that keep you from being who you should be. You have the ability to clip out those scenes that reflect a person you don't like, that you don't want to be. You can do that. That's a great gift, a great power, a great strength that a lot of people don't realize we have. We can't change what happened to us, but we can certainly change the amount of time we spend dwelling on it. We can certainly change the impact it has on us today. We can certainly change the way we feel about what happened to us in the past. 
you're writing a great story. Red pencil some of that bad stuff out and you will feel a whole lot better about your story as a result. All right, if you know a, a single fact about Alfred Hitchcock and his movies, what is it? He always shows up in them. He was the first director to do that. Now a lot of directors do that. But he was the first one. It didn't start because he had a big ego. It started because one of those silent movies he made, they needed a crowd scene and they couldn't afford to pay any more extras. And he said, well, I'll just get in there. He was kind of a crowd all by himself, you know. <laughs> and so he got in there and then people said, oh, that's the director right there. And he thought, oh, that's, that's kind of fun. And so he began the practice of being in every one of his movies from then on. And particularly all of his sound movies he makes appearances in. And so it's a fun little game to watch where Hitchcock shows up. In North by Northwest, it's during the opening credits. And... <laughs> He misses the bus in his own movie right after his big credit comes on screen. Uh, in the movie Notorious that somebody mentioned, Cary Grant, Ingrid Bergman, what an ugly couple. Man. Uh, this one is fairly, fairly late in the movie. I mean, it's, it's more than 30 minutes into the movie. Uh, Cary and Ingrid are going into this party where there's something sinister going on and they know they're going to have to do something to expose this plot. And so they're in this beautiful mansion, and they head for where the drinks are being served, and look who's drinking them up. Let's hope the liquor doesn't run out and start it down the cellar for more. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Quite a point. Thank you. And notice he never has a line. He never speaks. He never really interacts with the other actors. He could not act. If you remember his TV show, he was always very stiff standing in front of the camera. And so he just makes these little appearances, these little teaser appearances, and then he's gone. Uh, in the movie Spellbound, Ingrid Bergman, now with Gregory Peck, uh, she's in a hotel about to take the elevator. Look at the first guy out of the elevator. Uh, this movie, Strangers on a Train. How many of you have seen this? How many of you have seen Throw Mama from the Train? Yeah. This is the movie they talk about in Throw Mama from the Train. This is where uh, the Danny DeVito character gets the idea that he shares with the Billy Crystal character. Of What? Oh. Yeah, I don't know the song. It's a funny movie. But the movie they talk about, and the movie that Billy Crystal actually watches part of in the movie is Strangers on a Train uh, with Farley Granger. And uh, we see Hitch making an attempt to get on the train itself. Now in about four or five of his cameos, he's carrying a musical instrument of some kind. That, was kind of a little motif in itself for a while. But you know, when people realized, oh, he's going to show up in this movie somewhere, and they started watching for him, he realized that that could, that could hurt the movie. If he shows up an hour into a, an hour and a half movie, people are going to be sitting there the whole time going, is that him? No, that's not him. Oh, there, look over in the corner. No, the, people's attention was going to be on the wrong thing. So he usually made it very early in the movie, sometimes under the credits. Uh, now, this movie is called I Confess, and I'll bet not a whole lot of you have seen this, but Montgomery Cliff in this movie plays a priest, and uh, it's set in, in Toronto, I believe, and, and it opens with all these shots of big cathedrals and Gothic buildings, and then we will see Hitchcock sort of from a long way off. I love is the very next scene 
the director of the movie, and right after he shows up, there's a sign that says, Direction. <laughs> it's like a little credit on screen. Uh, very clever. This movie, Shadow of a Doubt, is Hitchcock's favorite of his own films. It's really good with Joseph Cotton. And uh, in this one, he's on the train playing cards with a doctor. The doctor's just been informed there's a sick person on board, but the doctor doesn't want to get involved. And so we don't see Hitch's face. We see the back of his head, and, and we also get to see I mean, tell the what he's a holding. Doctor. Ask if there's anything you can do. Maybe you can help that poor soul. Listen, I'm on my vacation. Porter, my husband's a doctor, and if there's anything oh, you can man, do... Oh, he's a very sick man. I won't see anyone. I haven't set eyes on him myself since we first got on the train. But you don't look very well either. Yeah, why does he look uh, strange? Look what he's holding. Not a bad hand. Now, Rear Window is one that uh, several of you have said you have seen. Rear Window, Jimmy Stewart plays a photographer, a, a press photographer, who has broken his leg trying to get a great picture at an automobile race, and he's confined to his apartment, and all he can do is look out the back window into the courtyard that's surrounded on all four sides by apartments. And so the movie is him beginning to notice what the people who live in this complex are up to. And one of them is up to no good. But how do we get Hitchcock into this scene, this apartment? Well, he shows up in the apartment of a songwriter. Winding the clock. Where's that wonderful music coming from? Uh, some songwriter over there in the studio apartment. Now, let me give you a great piece of trivia. The guy playing the piano is a guy named Ross Bagdasarian. Okay? Ross Bagdasarian is more famous under the name David Seville because he created Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> he discovered that you could make a record by speeding up your voice to different speeds, and so he's the one who recorded that, I still want a hula hoop. That's... <laughs> That's the guy in this Hitchcock movie. That's a good piece of trivia right there. Connection between Alvin and Alfred. Now, uh, one of my favorite cameos is in this movie. Again, uh, uh, this unsightly couple, Cary Grant and Grace Kelly, in To Catch a Thief. Cary Grant plays a, a reformed, retired cat burglar. And he's living in a, a beautiful villa somewhere in Europe. And all of a sudden, burglaries start happening again. And naturally, suspicion turns to this guy. And so he gets advance word that the police are on their way to his villa to question and possibly arrest him. So he slips out the back door and hops onto a bus that's coming by. There's the cops showing up. And again, no interaction between them, no dialogue. He's just, there he is. Vertigo, he has a very, uh, very brief, very quick uh, cameo in the early stages of this. Jimmy Stewart is walking to a building, and just before he gets there, we see Hitchcock cross the street carrying a tiny little trumpet in a case. Not much to it. And of course, the, the scene we saw earlier from the birds, uh, this again is one of my favorites just because you get to see so much of Hitch. <laughs> With his two little dogs. And Psycho, where does he show up in Psycho? Where? Nope. He shows up earlier in the movie when uh, Janet Lee is heading back to her office where she will steal the money that will send her on the run and have her staying at the Bates Motel. She hurries back to her office, look outside the window on the street in the Stetson hat. Mr. 
Mr. Lowry back from lunch? Now, this young lady on the left at the desk here is Patricia Hitchcock, his daughter, his only child. Had one child, and she was in several of his movies. Now, sometimes it was hard to uh, figure out how to do a cameo. Have any of you ever seen Lifeboat? This entire movie is set in a lifeboat with nine survivors of a ship that has been sunk. And so these nine people are in this lifeboat for days, floating in the middle of the ocean. How does Hitchcock make a cameo appearance in the middle of the ocean? Well, he thought about it. He thought at first he could maybe just be a body floating in the water. But he decided not to do that. Instead, What are you afraid of? He's one against seven. It was eight yesterday. Or have you forgotten? There's a piece in here about some people that were adrift in a lifeboat for 80 days. Say, maybe we can beat that record. Heaven forbid. Now, the cool thing is, both these pictures are really him. He had lost 100 pounds that year, and he was very proud of his ability to lose that much weight. And so he appeared in this ad for Reduso, the obesity slayer, in the middle of the ocean. His last appearance, of course, was in his last, uh, last film called Family Plot. And it's kind of neat because it echoes back to his TV show. This is Bruce, Bruce Dern. There he is. No, there is no death certificate here for Edward Shoebridge, only Harry J. Shoebridge and Sadie L. Shoebridge. So just a shadow on the door of the registrar's office, but very much like the silhouette that appeared in his TV show for many years, starting in the mid-50s. My favorite cameo, though, I've saved for last. It's not my favorite film by a long shot, but it's from Topaz, and I like it because of what Hitchcock does in this scene. Now, this is uh, early 70s, and he was getting up in years, uh, and so we see him, and he's in a wheelchair. And so I thought, oh, the poor guy, he's having trouble even getting around. Wheelchair will come in from the left side of the screen and keep your eyes on what he does. Andre. So he just walks off with that guy. I, I love that one. Well, now, what does all this have to do with anything? All right, this is my favorite one of these. Hitch on to this, y'all. We should always be alert for cameos by the creator. Because just in the same way that Hitchcock liked to pop up in all of his films and say, I am proud that I made this movie. I cannot wait to share it with you. That's the same way our God thinks of us and the, the world that he has built for us to inhabit. He is so pleased with it. He is so pleased that he made you. And he's so proud that he puts his stamp on you. But the, the awesome thing is that he, he doesn't just make a cameo at the beginning like Hitchcock does. He pops up throughout our lives. And Alfred Hitchcock is always recognizable. We always can spot him. I don't know why that changed. Uh, we can always spot him. But sometimes God shows up in ways that are not easy for us to recognize. Sometimes we may see him in nature. Sometimes we may see him in circumstance. But you know what? A lot of times we see him in another person. When another person performs an act that is so giving, so self-sacrificing, so uh, asking nothing in return, when we see acts like that, you're getting a little cameo of your creator. That's the reason I don't have a problem standing in a church on Sunday morning saying, we're going to talk about Alfred Hitchcock movies today. Every other church I've ever worked in, I never could have gotten away with that. Because sometimes churches don't really think about what they say they believe. Is God everywhere or is he not? If he's everywhere, can't we look for him in all these places? Can't we look for him in a beautiful sunset? Yes. Can't we look for him in the artistic creations of a guy like Alfred Hitchcock? I say absolutely. You can get little glimpses, little cameos of God anywhere. You just got to look for him. That's the thing. 
Most of us are not tuned to look. By the time Alfred Hitchcock had made 40 or 50 movies, everybody knew to watch for Hitchcock. Unfortunately, some people never realize they should be watching for God every moment of the day. Because when you start seeing him, the cool thing is, you start to notice more and more, I got a little glimpse of God. More and more, you start to see his work everywhere. And when that happens, your movie gets a whole lot better. Your story gets a whole lot more successful. Your joy becomes a lot more full when you realize that the creator is making cameos all the time. Next week, we're going to look at some of the really fascinating techniques that Hitchcock devised, things that you would never even notice, but yet when you know about them, will enhance your appreciation of his films a great deal. I could tell you about them now, but you're just going to have to trust me. <laughs> will you do that? Will you trust me? It's getting so you can't trust anyone these days. At any rate, we shall be back another time to explore further the dark alleyways of human behavior. Until then, good night.